Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for another hour of answering your gardening questions. We'd love to hear from you, so if you have a question or two, you can just give us a call, 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. We'd also be happy to hear from you via email. You can send those pictures to byf at unl.edu. Give us as much information as you can, including where you live. We answer those emails on a future show. During the week, be sure to check out our social media options, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. And let's start with samples. Jim, we know where you got this. Yes. We'll admit it. Right next door to your office. Exactly. I you didn't do it. Time courtyard. But this is amazing <laughs> because uh, this is showing aster. And on the, what's causing the damage here, kind of looks like spider mite damage, but it's actually lace bugs. And lace bugs are very specific insects on certain very restricted kinds of plants. And so here's aster lace bug, and they, are ten they tend to be flat, they're very small, and they're messy feeders. I mean, there's a lot of fecal spots. And then if, when they get on a plant or a shrub or a tree, they can cause uh, progressive damage over an entire season. So uh, this is a time of year to be looking for adult lace bug damage. Uh, they're laying eggs now, and you think about uh, shrubs that you might have, like we have, well, we have oaks, we have hawthorns, we have serviceberry, uh, sycamore, and there's a number of herbaceous uh, perennials that they get on too, so I can't mention them all. But if you've ever had lace bug injury, and just check again around your landscape for their presence and uh, check it also, their population increase by treating them if you have to, because uh, they are really difficult. Uh, once they get underway and start reaching vast numbers. So it's, it's better to treat them now than, than later. So aster lace bugs, uh, kinfolk to chrysanthemum lace bugs. Well, and those asters in our courtyard went from perfect to almost gone oh, in about yeah, three it's amazing. days. You, you have an oasis there in a negative sense there. <laughs> All oh, the rest of the plants and shrubs and trees are beautiful, but <laughs> this one happened to take a hit. All right, thanks, Jim. All right, Jeff, you're in the turf chair. That does not look like turf. It doesn't. You know, I um, tonight I wanted to bring in something to kind of illustrate uh, some turf alternatives. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, yellow archangel, lamiastrum. Uh, it's a ground cover. It's one that I, I like, um, but there are a lot of different ones. So it is, it's just to encourage people to think about using a variety of plants under maybe some trees or some places where we get a lot of questions about my turf is struggling, what can I do, how can I make my turf do better? I have this growing underneath a uh, little leaf linden, you know, it's dense shade, um, and it's just hard to, to grass slowly declined, and so I planted a little bit of this, it's taken off, and I don't have to worry about it. It's a living mulch, takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there's a lot of choices out there. The garden centers are full of, of good ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of encouraging folks to think about maybe some other plant choices than turf underneath some of those hard to grow places. Which is excellent, and that one, once you've got it, you've got it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it stays in, you know, I just kind of keep it mowed, yeah, and it exactly. stays in this place. Yeah, perfect. All right, Kyle. Well, we have some cherry leaf spot today. Uh, this is from, my, uh, from the black cherry tree in my yard. Uh, cherry leaf spot, fairly common on, on most types of cherries that we have, um, that we have in Nebraska. This, is a, this fungus overwinters on infected leaves in the soil, and you can see these, um, these brown lesions that we have. They kind of start off as these small purple spots, and then as they age, they'll elongate into and form kind of, get, turn kind of brown um, and get about a quarter inch across. What, and then what can happen eventually is the, uh, the centers of these spots can drop out, giving the leaves a bit of a shot hole appearance. And so sometimes you'll see this also known as shot hole fungus on, on cherries. As far as control for this one, uh, sanitation is going to be your best bet, especially if it's just a, an ornamental cherry in your, in your lawn. However, if you do have enough leaf spots that you're seeing pretty severe defoliation by say August into September, then maybe next year you're gonna to wanna to think about doing some sort of fungicide application. And this is a good time of year that you, to even do that fungicide application. All right, excellent. And black cherry, that's a, that's a great, fun, interesting native. Oh, it grew as a weed in my yard and I, I love it. Perfect. 
Okay, John, I think we have a little sex in the garden going on on your end. Well, that's right. So it, I think it's about time we had to talk, Kim. <laughs> so, uh, so I brought in some cucumbers, and what I wanted to illustrate with those is that some plants have flowers that have separate male and female parts, and some have both parts on them. So uh, most of the squash family, they're all separate, and you can actually, it's very important to know this because you need pollinators. You need bees or other pollinators to move the pollen from the male flower to the female flower, and that can explain some failure if you're not getting good cucumbers. But you can actually tell the difference between the flowers just by looking at them. So the, the easiest one is the female flower. And so I will uh, demonstrate here. So the female flower actually has the ovary attached that looks like a miniature version of what it's going to turn into. So these are cucumbers. These are actually mini cucumbers. Uh, and so those are little cucumbers that, are, that will develop. Uh, but we also have the male flowers, which we need for pollen. Uh, and uh, it can be a little hard to see, but those do not have the ovaries at the bottom. They're just a, a straight little uh, stem that attaches, uh, and it has a fun little name. It's called a peduncle, <laughs> right? So uh, that's uh, how those attach. Uh, and you know, we get questions like, some of my flowers aren't developing into fruit. This is why, because they're male and they won't develop into fruit. Sometimes we get lots of those early in the season to attract pollinators, so it could be that those flowers aren't setting. So that's a little bit of uh, a little uh, sex ed for, for gardeners there. <laughs> Wonderful, and usually if people buy cucumber seeds, there will be a, a male in the packet, right? Right. Males well, and typically. usually, you know, they're, the plants can have both on them. Some of them have mm -hmm. more male than female or, or vice versa. It really depends on the cultivar. Perfect. Thanks, John. All right. We have the very first question for okay, you, Jim, which a is picture. a picture. And this is essentially what insect is this? Okay. It's, a, it's kind of a fun looking thing and a little bit frightening actually yeah, in that, appearance. That's called a northern mole cricket. Oh. And they burrow in the turf grass. Usually you find them in meadows by creeks and water. Uh, they're not so much a problem in Nebraska, it's more of a curiosity. And the, way, the reason why we see them so often is because, <clears throat> believe it or not, they can fly and they're attracted to lights at night. And so a lot of people find them in driveways or you know, or along sidewalks or parking lots, that kind of thing. So a northern mole cricket, no problem. It's just an amazing curiosity, though, with its big digging kinds of front legs. Perfect. I wouldn't even think of that as a cricket, actually. No, yeah. and it actually goes, you know, once it's in the ground. It doesn't even chirp. <laughs> it just kind of drums. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Jeff, this is fun. Uh, this is a, a Greeley, Colorado viewer cool. who sent us this picture. She says this turf is creeping in from the neighbors and it goes in a straight line, doesn't get much over four inches tall. Uh, she says glyphosate is not doing much for management. She doesn't want it. So mm. A, what is it? And how B, how do you get rid of it? You know, that looks like Bermuda grass to me. Um, I've had that actually on my own lawn. We have it on campus in a few places as well. So it's not uncommon for us to, to have it in a sunny hot spot. It does well. My guess is uh, it's probably a south facing slope that where it's being grown and it, that's why it's kind of creeping in. Uh, if there's any bit of shade, uh, it's not gonna do very well. You know, it is fairly resistant to a lot of herbicides, so it can be kind of tough to kill. And there are some specialty products out there that um, I haven't had great luck with actually using some of those. So pulling is really the best method. Oh. And I mean, I know people hate it, but that's what I do. And even on campus where it gets into places we don't want it, we'll just dig it out. And that seems to handle it the best way. So, you know, just don't get it, let it get established and just kind of pull it back to the lot line or the fence line or wherever and just kind of stick with it and, you know, and get a little exercise, work on your tan. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so. All right, thanks, Jeff. All right, Kyle, uh, this is an oak, 20 years old, give or take, in Omaha. Um, a couple years ago, it, it actually had a, uh, a nice fungus growing from a crack in the trunk. What he does tell us is this was two seedlings next to each other that grew together into a single tree. Okay. And now they're beginning to see an increasing number of branches that are dying. Wondering, is there a tree disease going around? What do we say about both the double trunk and oak diseases, especially in the Omaha area? Yeah, well, there's a, a few things to ta tackle here. First of all, just looking at this picture that we have here on the screen, um, with 
What we have here is uh, bark inclusion, basically. So these two, uh, these two saplings, the, the trunks grew together and formed one, one larger bark, um, one larger trunk is what happened there. And that's where that crack came, came from that you can see. One of the problems with any time you have bark inclusion is that you can have an entry point for, for certain fungal pathogens as well. Now, the second part of this question, any sort of oak diseases that we're seeing in Nebraska or in the Omaha area especially. Um, we, ha we do have both burr oak blight and oak wilt that are in, um, are in eastern Nebraska. Um, burr oak blight only affects burr oaks, whereas oak wilt can affect really most of the oaks out there. It, it tends to hit red oaks quite a bit harder than the white oaks. Um, the one way to tell them apart is if you have oak wilt, what you'll start to see is the leaves will start to die or just turn brown um, from the t leaf tip and margins. And then that brown will just spread into to the midrib and towards the base of the leaf. And that's the, um, a, a diagnostic symptom of oak wilt. With oak wilt, you typically have to remove the plant um, as, as well as making sure there are no root grafts onto other healthy trees. Now with uh, burr oak blight, there what you start to see is just um, the veins on the, on the leaves will start to kind of darken, maybe turn a little bit brown, and then eventually they'll start to form these wedge-shaped lesions that may eventually take up half of the leaf. Um, but one of the nice things about burr oak blight is it will not immediately kill the trees, is one nice thing. Um, trees can kind of handle it for, for at least a couple of years. And there's also some, some research out there showing that, um, that fungicide applications are somewhat effective against burr oak blight as well. But if you have any questions, um, feel free to send in a sample. We'd love to, love to check it out. All right, thanks, Kyle. And unfortunately, that's probably a former tree for that. I for that think tree. so. It's, yeah, not long for this world. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, so speaking of trees, John, we have a couple of viewers who sent us questions about maples. The first is a Lincoln viewer. Um, she's no, no grading done, the, you know, nothing really that has happened to actually impact this tree, but it's clearly got some issues associated mm -hmm. with the base of the tree. And the second one is actually, we had a little bit of a conversation on Facebook about this one. The red maples and the tops are beginning to come out of them as you, or, or did. So she's wondering in the first one, what can she do? In the second one, what can she do? Right. So the first one there, the, the issue that we see at the base is really what's gonna affect the overall health of the plant. Uh, so we have things like uh, the girdling roots that are around the base. Uh, so we, we see those roots that are going around the trunk now and as, you know, as the tree gets bigger, those uh, roots start to impinge on the vascular tissue that's around the circumference of the tree. And so basically it'll start strangling the tree and we'll see limbs dying and it'll be a slow decline. And so eventually that, and by eventually I mean not too eventually, uh, <laughs> that tree will have to be removed. And that a lot of that happens from planting. Uh, when it's planted inappropriately, uh, usually, you know, the, the, it has pot bound issues that are not corrected by teasing out the roots or actually planting in amended soil can sometimes cause that because the tree roots don't want to leave the nice cushy mm -hmm. soil you put in the hole so they don't want to go on the native soil and so they just start growing around and around and so that's going to eventually have to come out. Okay. The other one, the, the newer tree, uh, probably what that uh, has going on, since it is younger and we have lots of new tender growth, that's probably winter damage from that. Uh, it could also be, if it's been dried out, that could be some drought damage, uh, depending on the time of year that that really happens. Uh, but the, the winter damage is also uh, from, from drying out as well a lot. Uh, so pruning that out, uh, having a way to manage that, like making sure it's watered well uh, when we go into winter, that can help reduce some of the winter damage. Uh, so just prune that out and hopefully it grows up and, and gets over the, the loss there. All right, thank you, John. Well, there are a few reasons your turf might look off color and feel a little bit spongy, but often it's due to those darn white grubs. Those immature beetles love munching on turf fruits. So for our first feature tonight, Jonathan Larson is going to tell us what you can do to control those white grubs. <laughs> White grubs are an annual pest that lots of folks deal with in their lawn. White grubs are the larval form of many different kinds of scarab beetles. 
The main ones that we deal with in turf are mass chafer white grubs, Japanese beetle white grubs, June beetle grubs, and also the green June beetle grub. These grubs, they live beneath the turf itself. They're very cryptic because of that. They live in the thatch and root zone, and many of them feed on the turf grass roots themselves, and that's how they can cause extensive damage. The green June beetle is a little different, doesn't actually feed on the roots of the turf, but when it tunnels through the turf grass, it can create uplifting, which can make sort of a mole-like pattern. But all of this can be very unsightly. People don't want to deal with it. And so sometimes people want to treat for grubs. There's a couple of different ways that we can manage grub problems. There's a preventative method, and then there's the curative method. Preventative is usually used on golf courses and on sports fields, so that they don't have any grub damage whatsoever. That's high value turf. We have to keep it looking nice and pristine. And so they treat in the month of June, typically, with a product like a Celeprin. There is a homeowner version of this product called Scott's Grub X and you can use that on your turf grass and your lawn if you really don't want to have any grub damage. Get that down after Mother's Day in the month of June. Definitely want to get it out before the July 4th. That way the plant has enough time to absorb the product. Then your plants will be systemically protected for this growing season. If a Japanese beetle or a mass chafer lays her eggs in your lawn, it'll hatch out, take a bite of the turf grass roots and go, it'll be dead because they have absorbed that product. Curative is a little different. With curative products, you can see control done with things like Dialox. You can use Clothianidin. You can also use Carbaryl. These products are put down in the fall after grub damage has already occurred. So we're talking late August, early September. You go out into your turf and you see big brown dead patches. And when you pick up on it, it rolls back like a rug from the floor. And when you look underneath, you'll see grubs. If you see six to eight grubs per square foot, it's a good thing to, to go out and treat that so that you can replace the grass that's been damaged. It's not gonna come back, but you can replace that turf and then hopefully treat those grubs so that they'll not be there damaging that new grass. You can get a professional to come in and use those products or you can apply them yourself. If you don't wanna use synthetic insecticides on your grass and use those against the grubs, there are some biological control options. Nematodes do work against white grubs. You can buy those at a gardening store or have a professional apply them. They do need to be watered in, just like those early season grub insecticides, so you get the product down into the root zone. You get those nematodes down in there, they'll infest the grubs and kill them. You can also just use good turf care practices and make your turf grass healthy. The healthier turf is, the more it's gonna be resilient to grub damage. So raising your mowing height, good fertilization practices and good irrigation will help make your turf nice and sturdy so that the grub damage won't affect it as much. That's great advice because that healthy stand of turf will stand up to grubs and those other pests like weeds and diseases. If you really want to do the preventative route, the next few weeks is a good time to get that mm -hmm. product down. And I assume that is correct on this well end of the table. June. Well into June. Well into June. Depending on what you use. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, we have an unhappy tree question, Jim, for you. And it is a Schubert choke cherry. And initially, she thought it was potentially some insect damage, mm -hmm. and whether it turns into shot hole or not is another question. So, yeah. what do you think here? Um, yeah, I see some some chewing on the see on the center left. So there's a leaf yeah. there, a cross section where you can see there's some chewing on the edge of the leaf. And so I'm suspecting that these are probably night visitors uh, <laughs> that are chewing on the leaves. If you don't, if you look around and up and down under the foliage and everything like that, and you don't see anything like canker worms or whatever, some kind of caterpillar. Um, I think maybe it's probably June beetles, like, well, actually the May beetles, those three-year um, grubs that, uh, that fly around at nighttime and they have chewing mouth parts and they in fact do chew on foliage of different kinds of trees and shrubs. That's what I suspect. And not really a nah, big deal? I mean, no, not, yeah. doesn't appear to be significant anyway, adds a little bit more ornamentation to the leaves. <laughs> Cut leaf Schubert cherry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure you can kill a Schubert yeah. cherry anyway if you want to know the truth. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff, your picture is from Henderson. They have a nice yard with some bluegrass and then a thicker bladed turf showing up, grows faster and taller. Uh, lawn looks great after mowing. Uh, what is it and how do they get rid of it? Well, I think they've got a little tall fescue mixed in with their bluegrass, which is not uncommon. In mm -hmm. fact, it's in a lot of seed mixes and you know it'll work into um, you know a lot of your 
lawns and gosh, if you have fescue, you might end up with a little bit of bluegrass in it. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's at this stage, it's really tough to kind of selectively remove that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and I think you'll find as we go through the summer, the bluegrass will catch up with the tall fescue and it'll be a little less noticeable. Uh, it's early in the spring, you know, this first part of the year, the, the fescue kind of takes off sooner than the, than the bluegrass. And so that's when we notice it a little bit more. But, um, you know, your lawn looks nice. Keep doing what you're doing. And, um, you know, it, I think you're, you're going to be fine. You, you have a nice, diverse lawn. So <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. All right, Kyle. Um, <clears throat> we actually answered this question a bit without the pictures, but it's a follow-up. A uh, great viewer from Clorinda, Iowa. Okay. With beautiful stand of rhubarb uh, looking like this, but then by the end of the season, the foliage really begins to yellow. Their concern is it's already happening this year. And they did get some rain. Uh, they don't think it's poor drainage, herbicide drift. What do you think is going on with, with rhubarb that would begin to do that yellowing? And here's the, the picture of the okay. yellowing leaves. Um, well, you know, rhubarb with those massive leaves that they have, especially when you have a stand this large, it's going to be using a lot of water, going to be taking a lot of nutrients from the soil. So I would just um, recommend making sure that it is adequately watered at least one inch per week um, for, that, for that rhubarb. And if you haven't already, maybe think about applying a fer um, just a well-balanced fertilizer, a typical 10-10-10 should, um, should be effective in helping it perk up. All right, excellent. So hopefully that will help. Yep, and I will take some pies as repayment. <laughs> so. I, already, I already said, where's the pie? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, your picture is of eggplant. Uh, she planted a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, and, and then they're showing this sort of interesting damage along the edges. Doesn't use chemicals. She wonders if it's herbicide drift. Um, she is by Firth, so that, you know, southeast corner of the state mm -hmm. where it's been hot and dry. So right. What do you think? Well, I don't think it's herbicide drift. I think it is actually just weather related. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, we take these plants from, you know, their nice cushy start in life and we like put them out in the world. It's just like you graduate, you know, and then you, <laughs> you're an adult, right? <laughs> these plants are expected to, to live on their own out in the harsh world. Uh, and I think it's probably most likely sun damage from sun scald. Uh, could be a little drying out from the heat where we don't have enough water to, to take up and we're evaporating a lot from the plants. So I think it's, it's just that type of condition. I don't think it's anything else with that plant. All right, excellent. Thanks, John. Well, it does seem like we just started our season yesterday and it was really chilly outside, but this past week conditions were just right for planting our garden. Let's take a minute to see what's happening out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, our master gardeners and great boots on the ground, workers have gotten everything planted. So every space, with the exception of maybe a couple of edges, is filled with beautiful annuals, vegetables. We'll be anxious to see what happens this year, especially with our All America selections, and see whether or not some of the plants that we have placed in combination with one another really look good by the end of the season. So we're making sure that our plants are soaked well enough to, to be able to get them through a long weekend be able to accommodate the wind and the sun and the increasingly hot temperatures for the summer months. We don't want to have things fry in our backyard farmer garden because then it's pretty impossible for us to be able to show you what works well and for you to enjoy that and then decide whether you want to use some of our plants that we talk about on the show in your own gardens at home. And that is what's happening this week in the backyard farmer garden. It's really great to have all those plants in the ground and already beginning to make us proud. So do not forget if you're in Lincoln, stop by East Campus, visit that backyard farmer garden any day, even during the night. You see some of those night flying marauders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, questions next. Uh, this is an insect question from Malcolm. She has what she thinks are bumblebees, but they don't act like the normal ones. Mm -hmm. Bodies are the same. Front half is brown, faces are black, and they dive bomb. Okay. <laughs> what are they? I'm thinking that those are eastern carpenter bees, and uh, they're starting to spread northward and westward in Nebraska. They've always been situated in the extreme southeast 
uh, corner of Nebraska. But uh, all that that interesting activity of dive bombing is actually the males they're jousting together, you know, for the privilege of mating with a, you know, with a female that comes by, and so. Oh, and they're also a little bit territorial too, so that's what's up going on. So the main thing is just with carpentry bees, they are a good and excellent pollinator of flowers, so keep that in mind. But check your you know, home premises uh, structures outside to see if there's any boring damage going on where they, they nest in wood, and so they'll be chewing channels in softer, weaker wood, and you don't want that to happen. So catch it while you can sooner, and then you could apply a, maybe a preventive kind of insecticide just to, to, to uh, deter them rather than have to kill, kill them, right. make them move somewhere else. Perfect, thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, their lawn got torn up by installing irrigation four inches below the lawn, so, you know, it's shallow. Mm -hmm. He, he's wondering, can he fill in with soil and overseed, or should he remove all the turf where the sprinklers were installed and then reseed or sod this time of year? Okay, so they removed the sod, or? It, well, it or sounds they, like maybe they just used a, a slitter or a trencher. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. okay. Well, you certainly, well, I would say you could go in, if there's bare soil, you don't need to remove anything. I would just go in and rake out that soil uh, and then just overseed with a similar sort of mix that you have in your lawn now. Um, there's some good covering products out there now, some good fabrics that you can put over that will help uh, improve your seed germination and keep that going a little, a little faster for you, especially with irrigation systems. So I think that would be the simplest thing. And keep it wet. Yeah, right. Yeah, all right. Kyle, this is a Skylar viewer that has an American Elm, full sun, um, mature when they moved in. So a nice one, but leaves are yellowing and falling off a little bit, no okay. spots, and it's not relegated to one spot, so Dutch Elm Probably not. <laughs> well, good, it's not Dutch yeah. Elm. Uh, yeah, yet. <laughs> yes, um, well, if it's just a general yellowing and um, leaves are kind of dropping from all over the plant, all over the tree, it's probably just uh, drought stress. Um, we've, mm -hmm. It's been really hot. Nebraska has had kind of drought conditions for quite a while. We had a really dry winter and the trees can still be experiencing some of that drought stress. So I just give it a really good watering as best you can and hope it recovers. All right, perfect, and enjoy it. Yes. Nothing like a big American elm. All right, John, an Adams viewer apparently has goji berries. Okay. And would like to know when and how to prune, and we have one in our backyard farmer garden. Right. <laughs> uh, so goji berries are, you know, you think of them as a, like a fruiting shrub, like blueberries or raspberries. They're actually in the tomato family. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're a little bit weird. Uh, so <laughs> most things, we want to prune them when they are dormant. We want to, you know, wait until fall or even early spring to prune them. One thing that you have to do with goji berries is that they have this big sprawling habit if you just plant it and let it go. So for at least the first few years after planting, and hopefully it's just planted, otherwise it'll be hard to, to train it out of this. You basically have to train it up. So you have to like cut everything that goes out and try to turn it into a tree or shrub. Otherwise it's going to try to be a, a ground creeper. Uh, and then, you know, just keep pruning in the direction you want it to grow to fill into a nice shrub. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the best thing you can do. Just watch out for the thorns. Oh, I know it. <laughs> right, they're, they're a vicious plant. Yes. How do you eat them? Well, they're usually dried. <laughs> they're, they're usually dried. They're considered like a superfood full of all the good antioxidants. Don't eat them raw because they taste like a watered down tomato something. I, it, they're not, not good even, raw. Yeah, it, yeah it, no. No, not, not good. Not good. <laughs> all right, thanks, John. While you are doing that, we will start the lightning round. All right, saddle your horses, gentlemen. Here we go. We're ready for the Here we competition. Go. <laughs> all right. So, would a mature concolor fir thin out on its own? This is a Council Bluffs viewer, John. It would, as they get older, the the ones uh, the the branches on that are lower sh get shaded out, and they naturally prune out their their needles. They're not needed anymore. All right. Uh, we have a Hastings viewer who says the top of their columnar birch died. Any idea? Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of that tonight. You know, could be drought, could be drying out, could be girdling roots. So take a look at those and see what what's going on. All right, a Woodbine, Iowa viewer has a moon glow moon glow pear that got hit by lightning, and then that one branch is yellow, but then it's okay. No big deal, or what? 
So you could you know, prune that out if you want. That's probably lightning uh, damage. So what lightning does is actually boils the tree inside. So you, <laughs> nice. you know, it doesn't like it. <laughs> How do you transport plants properly in a pickup? Uh, so you want to, to if, you, they, if they're going to roll around or, or be windy, you want to wrap them up with something, but use something that is breathable, uh, like a fabric or paper. Uh, you don't want to, to put plastic on them, especially in the sun. It could sort of burn them. Awesome. Nice job. Okay, Kyle, are you ready? Aren't I always? <laughs> you just love wow. lightning. You just love lightning. <laughs> Confidence. <Hey>. Right. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who planted a columbine plant last year and the leaves are wilting? Uh, I'd say it's too wet, dry it out a little bit. All right. What is the disease of hackberries or is there one that is causing the yellowing and the dropping of leaves right now? Uh, if it's a general yellowing across the entire tree, similar to that elm, it's probably just a little bit dry. Give it some water. All right. Uh, how do you tell the difference between a fungus and a lichen on a tree? Uh, look, first, look under the microscope. It's really the <laughs> only way to tell the difference. Um, or, or you can look at kind of where they're growing. Um, fungi tend to like kind of darker, more moist areas, whereas lichens can grow pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. All right. So with the mold spores in dry leaves that have been bagged for use in compost over winter in those bags? Um, yes, if you have not composted the leaves correctly, just throw them in the bags, those spores are still going to be active. All right. Um, are you seeing boxwood blight yet in Omaha? Has it come in? Not, not yet. Have, uh, have a couple of, a couple of people I've talked to, but have not had an official confirmation yet. All right. Keep your fingers crossed. Yes. On that one, especially on campus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. You ready? No. Yes, you are. Oh, yes. <laughs> Your first Thanks, question yeah. is easy. Yeah, okay. Number six, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Number six. So, can you please repeat for one of our viewers that ground cover name? Lamiast or Lamiastrum. Lamiastrum. Yeah, yellow archangel. The variegated one. Yeah. So last week, Matt recommended using a surfactant for a, for dry um, granular applications. Can this viewer use dish soap? Uh, you know, in the old days, we used to use sunlight dish soap for a lot of things. I would say there's very good surfactants out there. It's worth using those. They do a better job. All right. Uh, do we recommend rolling lawns to, to even them out? This is a very large lawn. Very, you know, you can certainly. You know, you, obviously, you're going to want to get it wet. I would suggest aerating it as well, also to help kind of even that out. But, yes, you can, if, if we've had some good rain or it's been well watered, you could roll it. Yes. All right. How do you get grass out of knockout roses? Uh, you dig up the rose and plant something else <laughs> and take the grass with it. That would be my best choice. But other than that, you're going to have to carefully get in there and pull the grass out. <laughs> On that one, I'm just laughing so hard. We'll Those give you next points. Because <laughs> <laughs> the knockout roses kind of got a knockout punch right. this year. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. You ready, Jim? Yeah, I'm ready. Go for it. Uh, we have a couple viewers who have sent us pictures of elm leaves that have looks like a little insect and it looks rusty. Rusty, is, probably those elm flea beetles that, that drill the tiny little holes in the leaves and then there are leaf miners as larvae on the leaves. All right. Uh, when do or should the praying mantises hatch? Now. So if you have some inside, take them outside. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who says they took a lot of witch's brooms out of their cedars. Are those caused by an insect or something else? Uh, I think it has to be some kind of a growth issue because I'm not familiar with any pests that would cause that. All right. We have a Springfield viewer who says uh, tons of June bugs. Is there anything they can do either now or next year to keep from getting as many June bugs? Uh, no, you really can't. It's just a natural thing that happens. Populations re reach peaks and then they diminish in other years. And so you're just about ready to have them. And so there's going to be lots more to come. <laughs> and those are mostly May beetles, those three-year grub adults. All right. Um, we have a viewer who says they have an asparagus bug that is black with white dots. That's probably the asparagus, asparagus beetle. It actually really is quite attractive, but they're abhorrent, you know, because they, <laughs> they feed on those canes and then they deposit these little grayish eggs, which turn out to be ugly, grayish, grubby looking larvae that feed on your asparagus. And so if you don't watch it, you'll have a bad aftertaste to your asparagus. Mm -hmm. Make sure you take them off. 
So <laughs> I don't know what else you can do, you know, row covers, but we're past the uh, mm -hmm. asparagus harvest season now. So right. let them grow and strengthen, and next year you do something about it. What, the bugs or the asparagus? <laughs> let the asparagus grow. Okay. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, what do we have for plants of the week this week? So we have two plants this week. So we have the snow dwarf mock mm -hmm. orange, which has an absolutely lovely, sweet fragrance. Uh, it's absolutely covered with flowers. It's a dwarf. Uh, it's full sun and takes dry uh, conditions, so it'd be perfect for like the weather we've been having lately, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have uh, a penstemon here uh, that uh, was bred by Dr. Dale Lindgren in North Platte. This is Prairie Dusk. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Rocky Mountain type with uh, narrow, glossy leaves. Uh, it also prefers full sun and uh, dry to average soil, uh, but will take uh, wetter. Uh, it's excellent for pollinators, uh, has great flowers, a preferred color for pollinators, pollinators like purpley, bluish mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. uh, and they're considered short-lived perennial, so they'll last a few years, but you'll probably have to replace them. Mm -hmm. And if our viewers would like to see those, like we said, come see the Backyard mm -hmm. Farmer Garden. They are in bloom right now. Right. Right now. So, so will those recede a little bit like a lot of penstemons? You know, we, we've only had those up there, the prairie dusk, for a couple, three years. And the, the colony we have is beautiful in place. We mm -hmm. haven't seen it recede like shell leaf, as mm -hmm. an example. But I don't know whether it will. It is a hybrid. Okay. So, uh, so far, pretty stable mm -hmm. for a penstemon. All right. Thanks, John. All right. Question with a picture for you, and this one is actually what what is causing this? I think we've had this before, but we have a lot of people saying, "What is this again?" And this is Omaha and Omaha. Yeah, <laughs> whenever it's droughty and dry, and you have a lot of dust, dry dirt that turns into dust, and it accumulates, or a cat, you know, that's stirring up the <laughs> the ground, the bare ground, uh, you end up with this loose soil, and so what happens is. Uh, uh, ant lions uh, will utilize that soft soil to to create their little pits, and there's a little there's a little uh, soft-bodied uh, creature at the bottom with big, huge claws in front or pincers in front, and it hides at the bottom. And so, any little insect, ants, and other insects that come to that cone accidentally fall in. Then it becomes the meal for the ant lion. So ant lions or doodle bugs are sometimes called. They're very, they're, they're amazing and interesting little creatures. Yeah. So take a tablespoon and dig down in there, wiggle it in there, and then kind of pull up pretty straight up, and you might find a little thing going like that, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to escape, you know. But it's, they're neat to watch. So I uh, think you should do a video segment on the. That would be cool. It would, Videos, be, it would be good. Yeah, and then the adults—they look like damselflies of all things. They're oh, they're wow. very pretty. Okay, mm. perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have another zoysia okay. question, or a zoysia. I guess the sure. other one was Bermuda grass. Right. Um, this is actually a Lincoln viewer, and she's been battling these zoysia patches for about a year. She's raked the thatch out. She's watered because it's crunchy. She's done weed and feed. Um, she does see some anthills along the concrete, which would be typical, but the other patches are kind of around the pole here and in the middle mm -hmm. of the yard. Mm -hmm. What do we think? Well, you know, zoysia, even though it's a warm season and we think of it as being kind of carefree in many ways, mm -hmm. it, it does require uh, fairly persistent or constant irrigation, you know, half an inch or so a week. And we've had some dry periods. Mm -hmm. And you'll see zoysia decline along pavement areas especially. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So it could be drought stress. Uh, compaction is also one of these things that is affected by that. So if people are walking or driving or riding their bikes over something, they could affect it. The other thing I thought is chinch bugs. Mm -hmm. That's also kind of an indication. So bifenthrin, something like that. Yeah, if, bifenthrin if they're... is still used uh, largely for controlling chinch bugs. Okay. And spider mites in the lawns too. Yeah, so that would be the other thing. If you're finding that, so what? If they pull it up and kind of dust around, would they see the chinch bugs crawling yeah, around? Yeah, that's the tricky thing. You know, if you can flood it with flood an area with a little bit of soapy water, put you know, take a can and cut out the bottom and make a little, you know, it's a little cylinder, mm -hmm. and then put it firmly down in there and take a little bit of soapy water and. Uh, Go ahead and soak that really well, and the chinch bugs usually come up. And they're boiling up. They don't like that, and so that way you can tell because otherwise they're very evasive, right? And they blend in with the dirt, and sometimes they play dead and that kind of thing, and that's not what you want. 
Okay. So Thanks. anyway, it could yeah. be a couple of side, you know, look at the chinch bug situation, think about the bifenthrin, and then kind of up your irrigation mm -hmm. a little bit. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so our first, what's wrong with the pear? Ooh. And it's a single picture. It's a Cass County viewer, and it's a lot of pear spots. Yeah, it's uh, the leaf almost looks orange. Mm hmm well, not entirely sure what what's going on with that pear. It could be a couple of things. That, um, it could be a rust. Um, another thing that it could be is Entomosporium leaf spot, which we have not officially seen in Nebraska, but we think it's close. Um, one thing that I would recommend is I'd look on the bottom, on the under, underside of that leaf, and if you're seeing some kind of fingers that are growing out of the bottom, mm -hmm. chances are it's a rust. If you're not seeing those fingers, it may be the other leaf spot. Uh, if it is the entomosporium leaf spot, fungicides work fairly well for, to control that. If it's one of the rusts, then you've probably missed your window for control this year. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of it in Lincoln, one yeah. or the other, and it's probably mm -hmm. the rust. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, this is a question we've gotten from two or three viewers, actually, in various parts of the state. The tops of spruce uh, doing some things that are interesting, and this viewer is from Denton, and they say they did treat for bagworms and they're wondering if is this something that needs to be treated? Well this actually can go back to my uh, cucumber sample and what plants do. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, so these are actually cones uh, so they will will reproduce uh, via cone uh, and so we we see that new growth so there's absolutely no reason to treat because it's perfectly healthy healthy and happy perfect mm -hmm. and also the new growth is and the new growth stuff. Green, yeah. you know mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah perfect. no no need to treat all right thanks John well keeping your lawn lush and green and your landscape beds healthy does take a little bit of work and as always really good timing right now Bill and I are going to help you with a few tips for things to do in the next coming weeks. Okay, Bill, people on Backyard Farmer accuse turf and trees of not playing well together. Do we or don't we? Well, they do with a chainsaw. And on that note, I'm gonna go find a landscape. You go ahead and talk about that turf. Okay, will do. So this time of year, a couple of things we're thinking about in turf management is one, where are we mowing? What mowing height? We've been mowing a lot because the grass grows really rapidly in early spring. And so dialing into a good three inch mowing height is highly recommended. Mowing weekly or maybe even more frequently is gonna help. Another thing to think about this time of year, fertilize. We generally don't wanna fertilize early in the spring. The grass grows really fast anyways. So let's fertilize now when it starts to slow down a little bit, keep that green color. And then set that irrigation system up so that we're watering just to keep the soil damp and not to keep it wet. So that might be one or two times a week maximum if we get no other rainfall. For weed control, too late on the pre's, we're kind of into a post-emergence type of a situation. We're gonna go out with uh, early crabgrass post-emergence products and those winter annuals will start to die off so I wouldn't worry too much about them. While Bill is messing with that mower, let's talk a little bit about what you should be doing now for your landscape. It's too late to prune most big trees and shrubs. We don't ever prune when it's leaf on, and right now we're in leaf on. It's not too late, however, to start looking at and thinking about pruning those early spring flowering shrubs. Lilacs are not quite ready to be pruned, but of course the forsythias and some of those very early viburnums, right now is the time. Important thing to note right now is pay real good attention to those watering practices. Hopefully your landscape is actually zoned for watering so that you are not relying on an irrigation system that is set for the turf to also water your landscape plants. Ideally, you'll also look at plants that are essentially in the wrong spot for what they need. Again, it might not be good timing to move some of those, but in some instances, you're better off to move it or lose it and get it into a location where it's going to have happier soil, happier light, happier envi environmental conditions. Pay attention to the mulch. If you need to recharge the mulch, make sure that soil is moist first so that you're not mulching over dry soil. Do not mulch too deeply and do not build those volcano mulch cones around the trunks of those trees. So in landscape beds, it's also too late for pre-emergence. If you're gonna use a post, you have to really be careful because you probably have a lot of plants in those beds that are going to be susceptible to damage. 
What that really means is for weed control in the landscape, it's time to ho, ho, ho. So maybe there is a little bit of value to these landscape plants. I think there is a lot of value to both that turf and those landscape plants. Those are some pretty simple things on your do it now list that will need your attention in the next few weeks. Once we do get past the cool spring temperatures, which appears to have happened, <laughs> it is time to sharpen that mower blade, keep a really sharp eye on those landscape plants. And we're gonna do this about once a month and say, you know, next time it's probably pests and insects to say, all right, what should you be doing now? Okay, this is a Midtown Omaha viewer who found a very peculiar spider hiding under a rock. We did have this earlier okay, in the season, yeah. but we, I don't think we've ever had it before, so. Yeah, the spider is called a pill bug hunter or sow bug hunter. It mainly lives in quite moist places under logs and stones and everything where it tends to be damp and of course where pill bugs and sow bugs tend to thrive as well. And so it has really long uh, chelicerae in front. The fangs are really long so that it can extract pill bugs out of little crevices and the like and feast on them. So uh, as bad as it might look as far as those lo long uh, chelicerae or fangs, it's not considered to be poisonous. Occasionally some make it into basements of homes and the like, but if you see it, you know, just pick it up in a jar or something and carry it outside where there's plenty of other pill bugs that could serve as food. All right, thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we have actually had this question a couple of times, uh, Jeff. It is an identification. This is clearly in a landscape bed, but we've had it come in from other people mm -hmm. who have it not in a landscape bed. What is it, and most importantly, how to control it? So that's Star of Bethlehem, and it's, um, you know, it's a bulb, mm -hmm. and uh, which makes it difficult to control. And while it is susceptible to uh, the non-selective herbicides and, and things like your three-way herbicides, it is somewhat uh, susceptible to some of those. Um, it is tough to kill, and um, I would say if you have it in your, if it's not, again, you know, for me, if there's 30 spots in your lawn, I would just go dig them up. Mm -hmm. Instead of going around trying to, you're gonna end up doing more damage to your lawn if you're trying to spray it out and do all that. You're gonna end up reseeding a lot. So I would suggest if it's not real bad, just dig them up. That'd be your simplest way to deal with it. Right. Pulling isn't gonna help. You're gonna have right. to dig them up. It's like Nut said, you pull it and right. you just make it mad. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, all right. Kyle, uh, we have a couple of viewers who um, have issues with their crab apples. Okay. And so uh, he initially thought this was a pear and with a little bit of uh, additional conversation, it's clearly an apple. They're already yellowing and dropping leaves that are looking like this. So what's going on already? Well, that looks like um, scab, so apple scab. Um, seems a little bit early to be seeing that severe of damage, but you know, over Memorial Day, we had 4th of July weather. So mm -hmm. seasons are kind of interesting right now. Uh, one of the things about scab is it's not, a, not at all uncommon for, for the, the entire leaf to turn yellow with only a few of those spots on there. And that's pretty indicative of scab as well. Um, as far as control, you know, sanitation is going to be your best friend, and you may want to start looking into a fungicide application next spring as well. Right, too late to spray. Too late now. Yeah, and I actually, I have a couple apples that are showing it already. Really? So I don't spray. I don't get any apples, the squirrels get yeah. them. <laughs> so I don't know what the point is. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a lake, um, a, a viewer from Iowa ride, mm -hmm. riding bikes at Lake Manawa. She found this um, beautiful shrub and lots of them, and uh, she does say it produces a lot of babes. So what is it and what, what do we say here, John? Right, it, it is a lovely looking shrub and it smells absolutely lovely uh, because it's actually related to uh, something else that is a weed and both of them are invasive. Uh, this is actually a, a honeysuckle. Uh, so it, it is uh, Lonicera macchiai, uh, the, the macchiai honeysuckle, or sometimes called the Amur honeysuckle, and it is invasive. Uh, so unfortunately, it'll just keep spreading in that lake and, and outcompete everything around it. And it's definitely something that you don't want to consider taking home and putting in your own landscape. Exactly. And that one is actually listed on our Nebraska Invasive Species mm. Council yes. list. So for people who really want to know what is invasive in the state, that's a, that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Everything from aquatic 
muscles to the insect questions mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. So beauty in a beauty in a bad package. <laughs> All right, uh, this is a friend, oh, announcements. We have announcements, right? One announcement for sure, which is us on location on Sunday at 1 p.m. in the Rock Garden at Harmon Park in Kearney. The weather is going to be beauteous. We're gonna have a lot of fun, so we hope a lot of people show up and, mm -hmm. and watch us do our thing and answer all of your questions in Kearney. All right, now, two questions. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> this is a friend viewer, a uh, friend, a friend and friend, who is wondering uh, about bee houses and wondering when the solitary bees will begin to come out. Oh, when they come out? Well, actually, mm -hmm. most of the, somewhere about early June, in the May to early June, the, the ones from the previous year will come out. Now, if you're talking about the, uh, the orchard mason bees, they come out early in the season out of the tubes if you ever have those. But if, if, you have, if you have a bee box and you have all those different kinds of cylinders and channels in there, the, the leaf cutter bees, which mostly they consist of, will be coming out now. Mm -hmm. And so there'd be a lot of activity. It's amazing to watch those things. It's not just one kind of a leaf cutter bee, mm -hmm. other kinds of species and families of bees. And they are, somehow they all know where to land and take off and, and they don't interfere with each other. Good traffic control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, Tom replaced our backyard mm -hmm. farmer bee house this year, our hotel, and it, he, he's done some pretty cool things with it, with, you know, some yeah. straw things and mm -hmm. neat to watch. All right, uh, Jeff, this is a viewer uh, from Omaha who has a yard that he, he does mow weekly, but he says it go, part of it goes to seed in about five days. He's wondering, will this continue as we go into summer? And are there varieties that do not produce such a, a plethora of seed early? Well, like everyone's been talking about the, the temperatures, our turf grasses did go to seed here with this warm, dry weather that we had here. I would suspect we'll see it slow down. Um, you know, I would just continue to do what you're doing. Uh, I've even, you know, we have us mowing folks, uh, we're mowing uh, four inches on campus right now because of the dry and the heat. Mm. So I've raised things up right away just to help preserve our turf. And, and so we're seeing seed heads below that height form. So I think it's, you know, like I said, I think it's because of our kind of our sudden summer that we had uh, has encouraged some of the grass to, to go to flower right away. So mm. I would just be patient. I don't think it's anything to worry about. All right, good. Okay, Kyle, we had a little discussion about this off air, but um, people are seeing these piles of things pop up in their lawn, like blobs of yellow and blobs of white, and what, what are those and what to do about it? Well, it might be dog vomit. However, uh, it's, um, the other th it's also probably a slime mold, also known as dog vomit fungus. <laughs> but uh, yeah, slime molds that are very ubiquitous. They can um, pretty much any bark that you, that's out there, there's slime mold that's living on it. Once it gets, uh, once there's enough moisture, that slime mold will pop up. It'll be very showy for a day or two. Then once it dries up, it'll just disappear. So enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> and they do come in quite a quite a wide variety of colors. Yes, they do. And if um, if you want it, if you're curious, you can even race them. So if you have a red slime mold and an orange slime mold, just put them next to each other and see which one hits the oatmeal first. <laughs> oh, That's what we were doing in the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> what fun! Okay, uh, John, we had a question. Uh, a viewer had some ornamental pears that had some bark damage and was knows that we're really saying let's not. They're becoming mm -hmm. invasive, but. This is, this is an Omaha viewer who has an ornamental pear that says it bloomed well this spring and it has thorns. It's a volunteer. Um, turning brown, what are we gonna say about this one? Well, you know, those pears, uh we really recommend against having the ornamental pears because they have so many problems, disease problems, they crack and break very easily. Could be uh, some early fire blight, they're very susceptible to that. Um, you know, but I would be, be looking for something to replace that in the near future. Like you said, it is a volunteer, so it came up and it's not really one that we plant. Right. Not yeah. legitimate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And, and those thorny twigs are, are one of yeah. the huge issues mm -hmm. associated with those volunteers. Not a good deal.